Good morning, everybody. Great to be here. Thank you, Tyler, and thank you to Randy Antic. Randy does an amazing job. I think we need to give Randy his own applause here. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to speak today about America's national parks. You know, as I was thinking about today and the program and the kind of the big themes, I thought about our Declaration of Independence. If you think about it, there's a famous clause in there which says, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Later this morning, you're going to hear from a great uh, medical panel, and they're going to talk about life. After lunch, you're going to hear from an amazing panel of military leaders, and they're going to help, who help protect our liberty. It's my job to talk about the one function in the federal government, which is about the pursuit of happiness. Think about that. Our national parks really are a way that we manifest our happiness. And I'm going to tell you some important things that I've learned and that you may not know about our national parks. I want to begin by asking you to think back to your own lives, to your own families, your own childhoods, your parents packing up a car, maybe one like this, the station wagon, you probably recognize the style, the road trip along highways and open plains that gave way to narrow, winding roads, leading perhaps to a moment of awe or discovery that you still carry with you today, that moment when you first discovered and encountered the beauty and majesty of America's national parks. Maybe it was one of the first, your first was at one of the iconic parks, standing there on the rim, gazing out in wonder at the vistas of the Grand Canyon, walking through Mariposa Grove, looking up at the falls in Yosemite, or getting sprayed by Old Faithful in Yellowstone National Park. Long before I arrived at the National Park Foundation, I too was a kid in a crowded car on similar journeys to Mesa Verde National Park at Cape Cod National Seashore. In our station wagon, there were multiple smokers in the front seat, and the windows were generally closed. In the back seat, there were a lot of sharp elbows being exchanged among the six kids. <laughs> you remember that. <laughs> it wasn't until years later as a recent college graduate, that I really began to find myself in parks. I discovered Point Reyes National Seashore, which happens to be my favorite national park. Back in 1981, I was 23 years old. I spent 48 out of 52 weekends in Point Reyes, in the beaches and headlands of this beautiful place, just an hour north of San Francisco. Hiking, biking, body surfing, kayaking, fishing, digging clams, gathering berries and wild mushrooms. There was so much to do and to discover, I couldn't wait to get there every weekend. And it was here that I started to become my own person, to find myself and deepen my love of the outdoors. I shared that year with a college sweetheart. I learned a little bit about love too. Alas, that romance didn't last, but it, I never stopped going to Point Reyes. It became a a bit of a rite of passage for the women I dated during that time. Well, they passed the Point Reyes test, as my friend Charlie used to say. And it was ultimately where I proposed to my wife at sunset on a cold day in November with the seals watching me awkwardly pose the question. They were my witness. As we raised our kids, it became our go-to place for our vacation week. The kids opened up on the hikes through the Douglas fir groves, spent hours on the beach building sandcastles and learned how to body surf as the pelicans flew by in formation. There's never been a better place for us to connect as a family. For me, our national parks are about family, about connecting with nature, about exploration and discovery and having fun. It turns out that in national parks, you can experience nature as wild as you want it, up close and personal. What you may not know is that 50 national parks have designated wilderness areas. This is the highest level of protection afforded to public lands. It means the lands are managed for their wild qualities so that no activities like grazing, timber harvesting, mining, oil and gas extraction, or motorized recreation can happen on these lands. These lands are for wildness and quiet. So a total of 67 million of the 84 million acres that are in our national park system are managed as wilderness, or more than 80% of all of our parklands. Voyagers National Park in northern Minnesota where I go, is where I go to reconnect and experience wilderness. 
get off the grid and to recharge my batteries. I make time every year for a week-long pilgrimage to Voyagers with, my, with Jeff Risberg, one of my oldest and best friends. And I'll just tell you that you have to be really good friends to spend a whole week in the wilderness with somebody. And Jeff and I have an amazing time together. As it turns out, it takes a long time to get to the wilderness. First, we drive five hours from the Twin Cities to Lake Cabotogama. From there, we get a ride seven miles across the lake and pack in our gear, 60-pound packs of it, three and a half miles across a trail called the Locator Trail. And then we load up our canoe and paddle another 12 miles to our campsite. It is during our time gliding across Locator, War Club, and Quill Lakes that the layers of stress and bombardment of technology give way to the silence, stunning beauty, and sweet smells of the wild. Then there is the almost spiritually significant ritual of cracking open a fine craft beer when we arrive at our campsite. There is that, too. Our view is of open water, red pine, white pine, and cedars, and open skies. Our senses are awakened in this land and waterscape. We are surrounded by wildlife, loons, bald eagles, otters, beavers, coyotes, and moose. Imagine the daily call of the loon, a cool breeze, the big blue sky on the lakes. Voyagers National Park draws me in like few places I've ever experienced. There's also a great lesson in taking a break from the modern conveniences and fending for yourself. You begin to see the world in a whole new way. You become more resourceful, better connected to yourself. Voyagers National Park feeds my soul. And parks are more than wild and scenic places. Our national parks not only connect us to nature, they also connect us to ourselves and our shared history and culture. Parks tell the story of who we are in all its glory and its imperfections. I like to say parks tell the good, the bad, and the ugly. During my time serving under Secretary of the Interior Ken Salazar, I happened to be with him in Little Rock, Arkansas, and decided to visit Little Rock Central High School National Historic Site. I had only recently become aware of the historic significance of this place and its role as the first test case in the desegregation of public schools in the post-Brown versus Board of Education world. But I have to admit, I didn't know how much, didn't know much about the Little Rock Nine, the nine black students who wanted to go to Little Rock Central High. The secretary and I were met that day by a woman named Minnie Jean Brown, one of the Little Rock Nine, who on September 25th, 1957, under the watchful eye of 1,200 armed soldiers, faced down an angry mob of protesters to help desegregate Little Rock Central High. What followed was having an incredible privilege of witnessing history through a woman who made history. As Minnie Jean walked with us down the long sidewalk to the front door of the school, telling us about what it was like to run the gauntlet of people yelling and screaming at her who wanted to deny her the opportunity of, to attend a public school, I got goosebumps. It was an amazing experience to be there. I had a whole window open to me by this woman describing that day when she was a spindly 16-year-old girl full of fear and confusion. As a relatively privileged white kid from suburban Denver, I had taken for granted that the public schools I attended and would attend would always be there for me, no question. I was only three months old that day in 1957, but on that day in 2011 when I was there with Minnie Jean, I experienced some deep gratitude for what she and her fellow classmates braved so that our society could take a step in the direction of equality. This notion of equality is something that also pertains to our national parks. And you saw on that last slide that Franklin Roosevelt said it well. And I like to think of national parks as a great leveler. All 418 of these national parks belong to all of us. And what's more democratic, 
And what could be a more eloquent expression of our democracy than giving every American the equal opportunity to share in the beauty and majesty of these sacred places? They are really the physical manifestation of our democracy. And our parks are also a source of unity. They are our common ground. As I've shared, experience I've had in parks that have inspired me, opened me to new possibilities, and grounded me in ways that no other places have, and it has helped me inform my now 38-year career in conservation, preservation, and public service. It's now my job to inspire all people to connect with these places and protect our unique national parks, what Wallace Segner called America's best idea. My park experiences, your park experiences, are all part of a shared American inheritance, places that belong to all of us, the living legacy that each generation passes to the next. As we look to the future, the public, capturing the public's imagination and commitment to the success of parks is as important now as it was more than a century ago when the national park system was, system was created. We follow in the footsteps of great innovators, park founders and early park supporters who understood that these places hold a special place in the American heart. Conservation icons John Muir and President Teddy Roosevelt provided vision and leadership to help establish national parks, recognizing the generational commitment that was required for their success. Philanthropists like John D. Rockefeller and the Mellon family set the standard for the catalytic role that private philanthropy could play to both support our parks, uh, to play to support our parks, contributing both land and dollars to create national parks for future generations. And the National Park Service, under the leadership of its first director, Stephen Mather, invited Americans to explore these immense cathedrals of natural beauty and wonder. Today, more than a century later, our national park system encompasses vast landscapes, seashores, mountains, rivers, and deserts, and hundreds of historical and cultural sites. 418 park units, to be exact, set in both rural and urban areas, across all 50 states and U.S. territories. An incredibly rich resource, national parks evoke the very essence of America, the spirit of innovation and, and discovery, that same spirit that propelled the Wright brothers' first flight and that produced the uniquely American sound of jazz from New Orleans. I believe America's national parks are not only America's best idea, but one of the best investments we can make. In each of the last two years, as we heard, more than 330 million people visited our national parks. So think about that. That's, we saw the big picture of the stadium, right, from Michigan, that's 107,000 people. But 330 million people is more than go to every single Disney park, major league football, baseball, hockey, and basketball, and NASCAR race, race each year combined. Think about that. That's kind of an amazing statistic. That's how much people love their national parks. Hey, today, however, this inheritance is increasingly at risk. Our parks face a number of important challenges, some of which are born out of being loved too much. Record visitation in recent years has put significant stress on the park system especially those parks that have shouldered so much of the increase in visitation each year. The top 25 most visited parks out of 418 received fully half of the 60 million new annual visitors since 2014. Yeah, we were at 270 million in 2014, we're now at 330 million. This has led to the damage to national park resources and diminished the park experience of visitors who face long interest lines and crowded trails and visitor centers. Funding levels for parks have also not kept pace, which has further diminished the possibilities for park rangers to have uh, a decent life and a, and a real living in, in, the, in the parks. All told, the current backlog of deferred maintenance in our national park system exceeds $12 billion. That's on an annual operating budget of $3 billion, so you get a sense of the scale of the impact that's going on right now. Underlying all these issues, the impact of a changing climate on our national parks 
and the communities and economies they, they support. From Glacier National Park in Montana to Denali in Alaska, glaciers are melting faster than ever. Pretty soon there will be no glaciers in Glacier National Park. Rising sea levels endanger the Everglades and other coastal parks. Increased drought and wildfires threaten parks um, all over the place. And while Congress and the administration need to focus on addressing these and other challenges, protecting our national parks has never been the work of government alone. Our parks are a shared responsibility that requires support and collaboration of government, citizens, private philanthropy, and corporations. We each have a role to play. And I'm happy to report that this collaboration is alive and well and growing. Volunteerism is thriving. In 2018, more than 300,000 people volunteered in our parks across the country, contributing well over 7 million hours of labor, valued at a whopping $178 million. Private philanthropy has also been an instrumental part of National Park Story and a success. Some of the most beautiful parks were made accessible to us all as a result of individuals who have stepped up to support and protect parks in a big way. From the Rockefeller families, can you go back for me? You're a little fast there. Thank you. From the Rockefeller families' contributions to establish Grand Teton National Park and Acadia National Parks, to Roxanne Quimby's donation of land to create Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument in Maine, and David Rubenstein's patriotic philanthropy to restore the Lincoln Memorial and Washington Monument and recently, Robert Smith's commitment to tell a fuller story of the African-American experience at places honoring Harriet Tubman and Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And millions more Americans who contribute more than $250 million a year to our parks. As people love their parks, it's not surprising that they are generous with their time and money to support them. With it, we're engaging who will be the first, the future stewards of our parks, giving economically disadvantaged kids the opportunity to experience the awe and wonder of a place like Everglades or our rich history on the National Mall. Our goal is to get all one million Title I fourth graders into a national park each year. We're giving even more kids an opportunity to do work in conservation corps, learning life skills, and connecting to these great places, hopefully, developing a, an ethic and a value for a lifetime. The corporate sector has also played an important role in supporting our parks. Roughly, each year, roughly 20% or about $20 million of our budget funding comes from corporate partners. That is compared to the average of nonprofit organizations of only 5%. This tells me how much corporate America values the National Parks brand and how well parks align with an American's values. Now, while the lion's share of funding should and will continue to come from the federal government, there is something for all of us to do. And we think that this is the difference, the real tangible investments that we can make right now when we do our part together as Americans. Looking ahead to the next century of park stewardship, protecting them is more important than ever. What national parks need now is our best, most innovative ideas, bold initiatives, and a clear vision for the future. We must reimagine what is possible for parks. And we've never been in a better position to protect our parks. As, as Wallace Stegner said, national parks are the best idea we ever had. Absolutely American, absolutely democratic. They reflect us at our best rather than our worst. Thank you very much.